Good afternoon, Georgia. I am Nakima Williams, chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia, and now proudly the Congresswoman-elect from Georgia's 5th Congressional District. It's great to be here this afternoon, and it's also great to be with so many Georgians who are ready to send my friends, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock to the United States Senate. Y'all, we've came so far together, and Georgia Democrats have done what others thought was impossible. We flipped Georgia blue. Georgians already knew it, but we've proved to, it, to the entire nation that Georgia is ready for a big change. Last month, we delivered our 16 electoral college votes to President-elect Joe Biden and my soror, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. And we're about to deliver not one, but two Georgia Democrats to the United States Senate in January. I couldn't be more proud of Georgia Democrats and the accomplishments that we've made together. But y'all, we're not done yet. All eyes are on Georgia. We will single-handedly determine the future of our country. COVID relief, healthcare, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the stakes just couldn't be higher. And it all comes down to Georgia. And not only are Georgians counting on us, the entire country is counting on us. A vote for John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock doesn't just mean change for Georgia. Working families across America will benefit from the hard work that we're putting in today. Our win in November was not simply luck. Our win is a direct result of the sweat and tears of Georgia Democrats over the years. It's taking us years of deep organizing and mobilizing voters, years of reaching out to overlook Georgians and reminding them of the power of their voice and their vote. They're true heroes of the 2020 election cycle were the Georgia voters who used the power of their voices. While I do love to boast about our incredible staff and volunteers and all of the hard work that has shaped Georgia for years to come, it was Georgia voters who showed up and showed out at the ballot box. It was the Georgia voters during the early voting period who brought folding chairs and waited hours to cast their ballot. It was the Georgia voters who applied for their absentee ballots and promptly mailed them back in. It was the Georgia voters who weren't quite sure that their vote would make a difference, but they showed up on election day anyway to make their voices heard. Georgia voters did this and we'll do it again. Don't get me wrong, it's gonna be a close election. Every vote will make a difference and every vote matters. There's a lot of noise trying to distract us right now, but Democrats are doubling down to engage with and support voters at every level from voter registration to the ballot box. It's all hands on deck and we need folks to vote and volunteer. We need you to help us to reach out to Georgia voters to make sure that they've got the tools they need to safely and securely cast their ballot. So visit us at Georgia Democrat, that's Georgia spelled out, georgiademocrat.org slash events to join the fight. We need every single concerned citizen to pitch in and help us make history. With your help, we will send John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock to the United States Senate. It's time for Georgia Republicans to face the consequences of their complicity. And on January 5th, we're gonna send David Perdue and Kelly Leffler packing. The opportunity to send not one, but two Democrats to the United States Senate is a chance of a lifetime. So let's not waste it, y'all. Volunteer and vote, and let's get it done. Thank you so much. I'm Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. I'm reminded of a quote by Atlanta's native son, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, we are not makers of history, we are made by history. I've often wondered what he meant by that. But as we are on the eve of one of the most important elections in our country and in our state's history, what I know to be true is this, 
generations that come after us will ask, where did we stand at this time? When we've asked our grandparents and our parents where they were during the civil rights movement, some said they swept floors, others said they marched, others said they made sandwiches, others have said, I voted. That's what we have to be able to tell our children's children, that we stood up and we made a difference, that when the opportunity for our nation to take a turn for the better was presented to us, we did all in our power to make a difference. So all of us may not be able to mobilize and knock on doors and make phone calls, but you can vote. You can also take the opportunity to make sure that those in your household go and vote. John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, two men of principle, two men of conscience, two men that can help us change the course of this nation. All eyes are on Georgia right now, but the power is within us. So remember, you have until December 7th to register to vote. Early voting starts December 14th and the election is on January 5th. Let's do what so many before us have done in Georgia. They changed the world simply by standing up and being counted. Our votes will reflect our voices and what our voices say loud and clear in this state is that we need people of good conscience so that our children's children will have a better future ahead. Thank you.
Hello, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us for this extraordinary moment where we will bring together our two candidates for the U.S. Senate, Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, with the 44th President of the United States, President Barack Obama. But before I bring them on, I want to talk about why we're here. You may remember a few weeks ago, we did something no one expected. We turned Georgia blue. We won this election decisively, and despite the number of recounts, it keeps giving us the same answer, that Georgia Democrats showed up, that Georgians showed up, and that we decided that we wanted to move this nation in the right direction, that we needed leadership that understood that the COVID pandemic deserves to be met with the ferocity and the intentionality of both science and a moral vision that says that we can make things better that we deserve justice in this nation for every person, and that we are at a moment where our economy desperately needs tending, and it cannot be simply measured by the stock market, it has to be measured by what's happening to folks at the supermarket. We have a moment now where we have a president-elect in Joe Biden and a vice president-elect Kamala Harris, but we're not done yet. We're not done because we still need to solidify the U.S. Senate. We have three branches of government, although sometimes it hasn't seemed like it. But in the Senate, we have the opportunity to match the needs of the people with the power of our leaders. And unfortunately for the state of Georgia, we have had two leaders that have been missing in action. Two people who have decided to put profit above the people. And two people who have refused to take responsibility for creating a culture of intimidation, a culture of fear, rather than cultivating a culture that believes in our democracy and is willing to fight to ensure that every voice is heard. But I want to talk about what Georgia can do to make this right. You see, we have two Senate seats that are up for grabs, but we know how to win those seats. We know how to knit together a coalition of the willing, a coalition of the good, a coalition of Georgians who want to not only serve the needs of their fellow citizens, but understand that we are part of knitting together the fabric of our nation and re-knitting the promise of who we can be. I'm excited because I know we can do it because we've just seen it done, but we know this didn't happen overnight. We know it has taken years to pull together, to lift up and indeed to mitigate the harms that kept voices from being heard. But we did something miraculous in November. We built a coalition that accomplished something that we hadn't been able to do in 28 years. But in this moment, we know what's going to happen. We know that we can continue to rely on the new voices that have come from young people who surged from 14 to 16 percent of our electorate. We can increase the participation of Asian American and Pacific Islander voices who between 2016 and 2020 increased their participation by 91 percent. Our Latino voices were amplified by 72% over 2020. African-American voices increased by 20%. And the white share increased by 16%. And I list every one of those communities because no one community can do it alone. We are a nation that is built on our diversity. And we are a state that reflects that diversity more than any other battleground state ever has. And what we can do in this moment is recognize that if we elect John Ossoff, if we elect Raphael Warnock, we are electing the future. We're electing two men who have given their lives to service, who despite not having the titles, have always been willing to do the work. Two men that I count not only as my candidates, but as my friends. And I look forward to introducing you to each of them. But for now, I'm going to start with my dear friend, the Reverend Raphael Warnock. I met Reverend Warnock 15 years ago when he came to pastor Ebenezer Baptist Church, but I got to know him best in 2014 when I launched a little project called the New Georgia Project to register the unregistered 800,000 people of color. When I reached out to Raphael Warnock and said, I need some help, I need someone to stand with me and talk about why this matters, he didn't balk, he didn't blanch, he not only stepped up, he stood firm and he defended those voices. He has worked tirelessly throughout his tenure as the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church to ensure that the left behind and the left out do not get forgotten when he is in the room. And that's why we need to send him to the U.S. Senate, because he understands that whether we're talking about access to health care, access to jobs, or access to justice, that we need to have someone who's understood what it means to be without those things, and someone who will always put the people over profit. 
And so please join me in welcoming my friend and our next U.S. Senator, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Well, thank you so very much, Stacy. It's always great to be with you. And I have enjoyed over the years uh, getting uh, uh, into good trouble, as John Lewis used to put it, uh, with you. Uh, good afternoon, Georgia, and, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. I'm honored, of course, to be with Stacy and uh, with John uh, in this fight together. And all of us are deeply honored, as always, to be with President Barack Obama, who inspires us all in so many ways. Uh, I want to thank our uh, Congresswoman, uh, Nakima Williams, a Congresswoman-elect. And I want to thank Atlanta's uh, great mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, for taking the time uh, this afternoon to help us to get out to vote. Well, I've been traveling all across the state. I have been making my way into cities and towns. And uh, when I go into these small towns, often they're surprised that I'm there. I'm surprised that they're surprised. Uh, they say that they're not accustomed to people running for the Senate or serving, dropping by these little towns, which is strange to me because John and I are running to be the next two senators for the whole state of Georgia. And uh, as I encounter people and their stories, I've been thinking a whole lot lately about my dad. Uh, I grew up as one of 12 children in public housing. We were short on money, but long on faith. And we had a deep sense of values and hard work. My dad used to wake me up every morning, seven days a week, 6 a.m. And he'd say, son, get up, get dressed, put your shoes on and get ready. And uh, sometimes I didn't understand. It was Saturday morning. I said, get ready for what? He said, I don't know. I'll figure it out a little bit later, but just get ready. And he just wanted me to be ready. And uh, that was a life lesson that I've taken with me all of my journey. And I just want to say to Georgians this afternoon that it's time for all of us to get ready, to put our shoes on. Uh, the battle is not over. Uh, we've got a race in front of us, and we intend to win. And we need all Georgians to recognize this deciding moment, this inflection point in our country. And Georgia's at the center of that inflection point. If you want to protect health care coverage for the 1.8 million Georgians with a pre-existing condition, get your shoes on and get ready. If you want pandemic relief for the Georgians who've had to close their doors to the dream business that they started from scratch, put your shoes on and get ready. If you're concerned about our teachers and our frontline workers and their ability to do the work that they're so deeply committed to, it's time for you to put your shoes on and get ready. If you want a U.S. Senate that takes on the challenges our country is facing and will partner with President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris to deliver for Georgia, uh, we need to put our shoes on and get ready to vote. The wind is at our back. The momentum is with us. The other side knows it. They're running scared, and they should be. Uh, but this is our moment. We're delighted that Georgia's on everybody's mind, and we need all Georgians to stand up in this defining moment in American history and win the future for all of our children. Again, thank you all for joining us, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Reverend Warnock. You talked about getting ready, and I want to just point out that we've hit a milestone in Georgia already where more than one million Georgians have applied for absentee ballots. And we encourage everyone who needs to make a plan to vote to go to peachvote.com so you can apply for your absentee ballot, find out about how early voting starts in Georgia on December 14th. And if you're not registered to vote yet, or if you've got someone who's going to be 18 by January 5th, make certain that you go to that website so you can learn how to get them registered to vote by December 7th. One of the reasons we need folks to get registered and to make their plan is to not only send Raphael Warnock to the U.S. Senate, but we always know we need help. And the partner that he deserves, the partner that Georgia deserves, is a young man that I had a chance to meet for the first time in 2017. I served as Democratic leader, and there are a lot of folks who came by my office to ask for my support for a special election that was occurring in 2017. But what was so remarkable about John Ossoff was that he didn't just come with a plan. He came with questions. 
He wanted to know about what he needed to do to build the multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational coalition it would take to win that district. And what was so impressive about John was not just that he asked for advice, he listened. John makes it his mission to understand as an investigative journalist, as a documentarian, as someone who runs a small business, he understands how important it is that we not only ask the right questions, but that we listen to the answers we're given and that we do our best to make certain that right always wins. He is fighting a battle against someone who has spent six years not meeting with his constituents, not serving the people, not being willing to answer the questions. But I know that with John Ossoff as the next U.S. Senator, we will have a man working side by side with Raphael Warnock, who will always ask Georgians, what do we need and how can he help? Please help me welcome our next U.S. Senator, John Ossoff. Thank you so, so much, Stacey. I love you. Thank you for what you've done for the state of Georgia throughout your career, building over these last 10 years. Reverend, it's an honor to run alongside you. And President Obama, what an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for lending a hand and for your support and your friendship. My mother was about 23 years old when she came to this country alone as an immigrant. Because for her, America represented hope. She believed we were on a country, on a journey, making progress to fully realize our founding ideals, that we were equal in God's eyes, that opportunity and rights were given equally to all of us. That's the vision of this country that drew my mother here as a young woman. She became an activist and marched for the Equal Rights Amendment. She became a businesswoman. She became a citizen because she recognized that the ballot box is where we push this country forward. And what happened in these last four years as our country has been ripped apart by fear and division, broke my mother's heart. And what's happened in this last year, as the catastrophic failure of our leaders has compounded the death toll and the economic damage from this pandemic has broken so many hearts. But if you're wondering what you've been feeling in your heart these last four weeks, maybe an unfamiliar feeling that you haven't felt in a while, that is called hope. And it reminds us of what we felt 12 years ago when Barack Obama ran for president at a time of war and recession and financial crisis and put hope in our hearts. And Georgia right now represents the hope of the nation because what's happening in Georgia is such a beautiful clarification of where the American South is and where our state is. You got the young Jewish journalist son of an immigrant running alongside a black preacher who holds Dr. King's pulpit at Ebenezer Baptist Church, leading a grassroots movement for health, jobs, and justice in the midst of a crisis. And we're running against like the Bonnie and Clyde of political corruption in America, who represent politicians who put themselves over the people. We have the chance in Georgia to stand up and make a difference, to define a future where all of us have equal justice under the law, where all of us can get the health care that we need, to leave future generations a clean and beautiful planet, to make sure everyone has access to dignified work that pays a living wage, to empower the health experts to get us out of this crisis and get economic relief to people who need it. That's what's on the line. I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this moment. Let's make history and win these races and write the next chapter in American history together. Thank you so much, Stacy, Reverend, and Mr. President. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for the work you've been willing to do and the way you've continued to meet this moment. It is my distinct pleasure now to introduce uh, the reason we're all here. And I had the opportunity to first meet uh, him as a senator. He was in the state of Georgia in 2007. We were in a small conference room. And I don't think I appreciated at that moment just how extraordinary the conversation I was able to have was. Uh, because Barack Obama met with a group of us talking about his vision for the presidency, but what he was willing to do was to listen to us 
to a group of state legislators as we described the concerns in our communities, as we talked about the fears of our people. And unlike so many politicians who will often interrupt you to tell you what they think you already need to know, he listened. And more importantly, because he had been in the state legislature, because he was a US Senator, he took that information with him into the White House. And for eight years, we watched someone who loved not just the notion of America, but the people of our country. We watched him lead us through crisis. We watched him guide us to better ideas and higher ideals. Someone who brought with him his training as an organizer, his commitment as a state legislator, his knowledge of, as a constitutional scholar, his leadership as a US Senator, but more importantly, his ethic as just a good man who understands what it means to stand up for others, to deliver on your promises, but to always tell the truth about what's possible, but encouraging us always to dream about what's, what stands before us. There is nothing inevitable about success, but what we saw with Barack Obama in 2008 and again in 2012 is what we have here in Georgia in 2020. We have the opportunity to build a better future and there is no one better to talk about why John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock are part of that future than the great man himself, President Barack Obama. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, you know, uh, I I need Michelle to hear that introduction because <laughs> you know, sometimes you're not always a prophet in your own land. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, you've been such a good friend, uh, but more importantly, you've been such an extraordinary leader. Uh, and uh, it is wonderful to see uh, John and Reverend, uh, two candidates who not only know their stuff, not only have specific plans around advancing health, jobs, and justice, uh, but have shown a lifetime commitment to making sure that all people have a seat at the table, uh, who for a lifetime have dedicated their life to service, uh, who have displayed again and again and again that they care about people, including or maybe especially the least of these. Uh, and uh, have the kind of integrity that you know, we want to see in public service. So uh, it's a treat to be with all of you. I'm going to try to be relatively brief so we leave as much time for questions as possible. Uh, I think I have uh, a couple of jobs here. The first um, is to send a message from the nation that we sure are proud of Georgia because the coalition that you described, Stacy, the excitement, commitment, turnout, the insistence on, on creating uh, coalitions rather than divisions among people of different backgrounds and ethnicities and income brackets uh, and regions, uh, all of that uh, describes a vision of what not just Georgia can be, but what America can be. And you did so under some difficult circumstances because historically, as we know, it's not as if uh, all the machinery of Georgia government uh, has done everything it can to encourage people to participate in the voting process. Uh, and, and so uh, that kind of movement spirit uh, combined with great tactics and strategy and hard work and a message about how you know, we need a politics that works for ordinary people, not for insiders, not for the high and mighty, but for everybody, for the single mom who's you know, working a 
uh, uh, low wage job, uh, but is committed to making sure that she's taking care of her kids and, and that their, her kids have a better future. Uh, for the retirees who are scrimping and scraping and trying to figure out how can they uh, you know, live lives of dignity and respect that reflects a lifetime of work uh, you know, for the college student that is worrying about uh, making sure that they can uh, keep up with their tuition payments uh, and have big dreams, uh, but uh, need a little bit of help to get there. I, you know, those were the folks that you inspired, that you worked on behalf. Uh, and what we saw in November was uh, Georgia doing something that a lot of folks didn't think was possible. Uh, and that's because not just of the three folks that you know, I'm, I'm sharing this Zoom stage with, uh, but all the unheralded volunteers and workers and, and grassroots folks uh, who, who believed. And, and so I, my, my first message is thank you, Georgia, because you inspired us and you point the way for the rest of the country. The second job I have is to say, uh, you know, the problem with doing such a good job is I guess, you know, folks come back and ask you to do some more. And uh, you are now, once again, the center of our uh, civic universe because the special election in Georgia is going to determine ultimately the course of the Biden presidency and whether Joe Biden and Kamala Harris can deliver legislatively all the commitments they've made. And, uh, you know, since I've, I've got a reverend with me here, uh, let me give some testimony. Because I know something about the importance of the U.S. Senate. Uh, some of the people who are watching will recall the early days of my presidency. Others are too young, that's okay. Uh, but I could not be prouder of the track record of what we accomplished. The Affordable Care Act, providing millions of people health insurance who didn't have it before and setting the standard that says everybody should have health insurance and providing protections for pre-existing conditions. Uh, you know, us passing uh, Wall Street reform so that we wouldn't repeat some of the outrageous behavior that we saw on Wall Street that caused a financial crisis and financial ruin for so many on Main Street. Uh, the work we did to save the economy from a Great Depression, to trigger a whole uh, renaissance of green initiatives uh, to help not just save the planet, but create jobs and clean energy across the country. Uh, you know, providing broadband lines into rural communities uh, that didn't have it before so young people could uh, have the same advantages that folks in the cities had. We, very proud of the work we did. But even with a big majority in the Senate and the House, it was still a struggle because the way the U.S. Senate is set up, it is possible for uh, those who want to stop progress, those who don't want everybody from having health care, those who don't want uh, to make sure that we have fair wages uh, for our workers, those who aren't interested in protecting the planet from environmental degradation, that the Senate is a place where even with a big majority, it's tough to get legislation through. And if you don't have a majority, if the Senate is controlled by Republicans who are interested in obstruction and gridlock rather than progress and helping people, they can block just about anything. And so, although the first two years of my presidency were the most productive legislatively since Lyndon B. Johnson, once Mitch McConnell 
was controlling that gavel and controlling the agenda in the Senate, we saw a lot of progress halt. And it slowed down our ability to recover. It slowed down growth. It slowed down our ability to get uh, it to implement healthcare so that more people had uh, access to uh, affordable care and protections uh, from uh, insurance companies that didn't want to give them coverage. And so the Senate really matters. And one of the frustrations that I had during my presidency was oftentimes, you know, folks who were even my supporters, they'd say, well, you know what? Look, we got Barack there now. We got Michelle, she's first lady. She looks pretty. And she's doing great work. And you know, uh, we trust them. And so we don't have to do anything now. And in fact, then we got, when we got to the midterms, it got even worse because a bunch of our folks stopped voting and we lost the house too. So I, I say all this, I, I'm giving this history for a reason. The promise of the Biden presidency and the Harris vice presidency rests in part on their ability to have a cooperative posture with Congress. And to do that, we have to have the two gentlemen who are running for Senate in Georgia, Raphael Warnock and John Asa, there to help move that agenda forward. Uh, if we win those two seats, then you have a 50-50 situation in the Senate. And by the way, uh, I'm making here not just a partisan statement, the good news if you have that kind of 50-50 situation is it frees up some of those Republicans who know better to say, well, maybe we should cooperate. The ones who are slightly more independent minded. And John and Raphael are the kind of uh, big tent inclusive people that can also have conversations across the aisle and get some cooperation. So it, it, it's not just that we need those two seats in order for uh, uh, you know, Democrats to control the agenda. But it's also, I think, these are the kinds of gentlemen who are going to be able to um, create an atmosphere of, of, of cooperation, of progress, uh, and most of all, keeping the concerns of the American people and the people of Georgia first. Uh, and so I'm hoping that Everybody understands the urgency uh, of this upcoming election. Anybody who's listening right now, uh, you need to understand this is not just about uh, Georgia. This is about America, and this is about the world. Uh, and it's in your power to, in fact, uh, have an impact. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, while I have you here, I'm going to take a moment and ask you our, our first question you you've just alluded to why this moment is so important but we keep hearing this phrase this is the most important election of our lifetime and we just had that in november and you've given i think an extraordinary description of why the senate matters but what's one additional difference that you see in this election for these two gentlemen what does that mean for our country and why should someone who is still thinking about whether they should get out or not what's the reason that they should go well, I'm, I'm going to give a couple reasons real quick. Uh, number one, uh, you've got two candidates in Vermin Warnock and John Ossoff who have shown themselves repeatedly to operate at the highest levels of integrity. And let's face it, uh, you know, you've got two incumbent senators who, in the midst of the worst public health crisis that any of us have seen in our lifetimes, we know we're first and foremost worried about their stock portfolio. Goodness gracious. I mean, I, that alone should tell you something. I, I, I mean, somehow we've become inured to this kind of stuff. But when you've got a couple of senators who are downplaying a pandemic, 
towing the line of a president who botches the response to the pandemic, despite the fact that my administration had given them an actual playbook on how to deal with pandemics. And then as they're downplaying it, as they're ignoring the science and epidemiologists and suggesting that, you know, this is uh, something that is, is some partisan issue as opposed to something that Americans should rally around. At the same time, behind closed doors, they're calling their brokers. I, that's not public service. Uh, and, and so that alone should motivate, I hope, the people of Georgia to say, we want somebody in there who cares about us and who's thinking about us and is working for us every day. It doesn't mean that Reverend Warnock and, and John Ossoff are going to be perfect or they're going to solve every problem of every Georgian right away as a consequence of uh, being elected any more than electing me you know, uh, solved every problem or that I didn't make mistakes or, or uh, you know, that there were still issues that were pending after eight years of me being president. But the one thing I could say about my presidency and the one thing I can say about John and Raphael for certain is I know they're going to be working every single day to make sure that they are doing their absolute best to serve the people that serve them there. And that's the bare minimum that anybody should, should want. But beyond that, as I said, what is also at stake is if we're going to get uh, significant economic relief for small businesses in Georgia that are suffering because of the pandemic, if we're going to seriously deal with the aftermath of the pandemic, if we are going to uh, start uh, building on the Affordable Care Act and making it even stronger so more people are reached, those kinds of agenda items require legislative initiatives, and we can't get that done unless we've got not just a White House, but also willing partners in Congress. And these two gentlemen, uh, John and, and Raphael, I know that that's what they want to get done. Thank you. So we've got some questions from folks from around the state and John, I'm gonna to come to you next. Uh, similar to the, the question I asked the president, you know, you've been doing, you have this extraordinary commercial with a young, uh, with a business owner from Preston, Georgia. And she talks about the consequences of COVID and the consequences of failed leadership. Can you talk about why you think that this election is the most important and what's different about this moment? Yeah, and Stacy, that's that's Marilyn Crimes. You probably met her. She runs Mom's Kitchen over in Preston, and it's just a family business. And she she wanted to tell the people that what President Obama just described, having so-called public servants more concerned with enriching themselves during a crisis than delivering basic economic relief for ordinary people, is totally unacceptable. I mean, it's not just that, for example, Senator Perdue has been blocking relief for ordinary people since midsummer. He was against it at all in the first place. He fought against a single $1,200 stimulus check for working people while he was furiously buying up medical and vaccine stocks and dumping his casino shares while he had access to classified briefings on COVID-19 in the Senate. It is such a gross abuse of power. And the story that Marilyn wanted to tell is here she is running a family business She's not getting help from the federal government and the individual supposed to be representing her isn't even looking out for her. He's looking out for himself. And the reason that this election matters so much, it's just like President Obama said, we all know Mitch McConnell's heart. We all know that he's going to try to do to Joe and Kamala just like he tried to do to President Obama. And partisan paralysis in a crisis like this is totally untenable. We've got to empower health experts like Georgia's own CDC. We've got to rush the direct economic relief they've been holding up since the summer to people who are suffering. And our opponents, you know, my opponent lives on a private island behind three gates. The Reverend's opponent's family literally owns the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange. They, they don't care about regular people. And they will be part of that gridlock and obstructionism at a moment when we need strong action and a united front, a United States of America 
to confront this public health crisis and get us back on our feet economically. Raphael, I want to bring you into this conversation. You have spent you know, most of your adult life, starting when you were in high school, actually, before you were an adult, thinking about the issues of health care. And this election is absolutely going to be a referendum on health care. Can you talk about why this moment is so different and why it's so incredibly important that we have people who turn out and who understand what's at stake? Thank you. Well, as you point out, I've been working on health care for years. Um, and when uh, President Obama and others were pushing through the Affordable Care Act, I was preaching about it from the pulpit at Ebenezer, reminding the folks who gather there that if you just casually move through the Gospels, you're not going to have any trouble running into a healing story. Jesus spent a lot of time healing the sick. And the stories in our, in our holy books, Lion Bartimaeus had a pre-existing condition. So did the woman with the, the hemorrhage. And I, I believe health care is a human right. And it's certainly something the wealthiest nation on the planet can and ought to provide to all of its citizens. And so we were making the argument then and saying that we don't suffer from a lack of resources, but a lack of moral imagination and political will to do the right thing. And here we are all of these years later, and Georgia is one of only 12 states that is yet uh, to expand Medicaid. And so I've been moving all across Georgia and I go into these rural communities and they're the ones that have been most devastated by our refusal to expand Medicaid. We're subsidizing healthcare in Illinois and in California and New York and our hospitals are closing nine in the last 10 years. Uh, so it was already an urgent issue, but the pandemic brought these longstanding disparities in healthcare and economic disparities into sharper focus. So that the people who are already hurting are hurting even more. We should have known before the pandemic that I need my neighbor to be covered. That if, if, if she is uncovered, that, that that has implications not only for her family, but for mine. But when you're dealing with a deadly airborne disease, Suddenly we learn that we're as close to each other's humanity as a cough, as a sneeze. That person might be uncovered, but I'm unprotected. We're tied, as Dr. King said, in a single garment of destiny. So, so the pandemic has brought it into sharper focus and has made it even more urgent. And uh, we got to strengthen the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we've got to make sure that we get more people covered. And we need representation in the Senate that's not there to represent Big Pharma. So that while claiming to be the you know, captains of industry and so committed to free enterprise, you don't want the pharmaceutical companies to have to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs with Medicare. That doesn't make any sense. And uh, so this work needs to be done. It's urgent. And... Um, uh, I'm just honored to be a part of that conversation. Well, we know now why we need to do this. Let's talk about what we need to do. And I think that's going to be the most uh, the most meaningful part of, of this conversation, because when we've got President Obama, we've got Reverend Warnock, and we've got John Ossoff, and you have an opportunity to tell everyone watching and everyone who's going to be replaying this, we want to give them three things to do. So I'm going to ask each of you to give me one thing uh, that they can do to make certain that we can meet this moment and achieve the outcomes of you know getting ready and having hope and really continuing to fix our country. So John, I'm going to start with you. What's one thing you want people watching to do to make this happen? Georgia, and especially young people here in Georgia, make a plan to vote. Make a plan to vote. December 14th, the first day of early voting. Vote for health and jobs and justice. Vote to get us out of this crisis. We can pass a new Civil Rights Act. We can make sure that everybody has the health care they need. We can protect our environment. The future is limitless, but we've got to win these races. It's going to come down to youth turnout. So I am calling on young people in Georgia to make a plan to vote. Reverend Warnock. 
And on that score, I, I want to say that uh, young people who weren't, who were not eligible to vote on November 3rd, if you're 17, you'll be 18 by election day, you can still register. You have until uh, December the 7th, uh, just a couple more days to get registered. So register to vote. Uh, and then to everybody else, make sure that uh, uh, you vote and make sure that everybody in your circle votes. Um, uh, all of our faith leaders, uh, voter participation uh, is a nonpartisan exercise. It is something you can certainly push from your pulpit. Uh, I believe that a vote is a kind of prayer for the kind of world that we want to live in. And so if you're sitting uh, in someone's temple, church, mosque, virtually these days, uh, reach out to the leader of that congregation and make sure that we get the word out through all of these networks, our, our fraternities, our sororities. You see, I'm wearing my colors today. It's, uh, it's the anniversary of Alpha Phi Alpha, but whatever fraternity or sorority you're a part of, I, I had to give my brothers a shout out. Uh, make sure that you reach out through these networks and get everybody uh, out to vote. We can win this election. We have the coalition. If we show up, we win. And President Obama, you you launched so many uh, coalitions and reset the belief in what was possible for millions of Americans, including those of us here in Georgia who have been working so hard to meet the vision that you've set. What's the thing that you want folks to understand they need to do between now and January 5th to make the world the way we want it to be? Believe in your own power. Uh, you know, the vote is an expression that what each of us does matter. And we live in a time and a world where so often we are given the message that you have to be wealthy, you have to be powerful, you have to have connections in order to have influence. But the premise of our nation is all people have a voice. All people have power in a government of, by, and for the people. And I think about our dear friend, John Lewis, who's looking down on us. Who would have thought that a young man in his early 20s with a kind of a scruffy looking overcoat and a backpack standing at the front of a bridge would end up triggering a moral awakening that transformed a nation. And yet that's what happened. And, and that was because he understood as Stacy and John and Raphael understand, as, as I understood uh, when I started on this journey that um, the faith that all of us matter and all of us have a voice, when that catches fire, when that is something that we all believe, amazing things happen, uh, impossible things happen. Uh, and, and, and you are now, anybody who is within the sound of my voice right now, you have the possibility of sparking that kind of change. Uh, and it's not, by the way, just by talking to the converted. I mean, one of the reasons that Georgia ended up voting after a recount after a recount <laughs> for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris was because there were a number of folks who decided, you know what, partisanship only goes so far. At a certain point, what matters is integrity and what matters is values. What matters is how we treat each other. And I think there's still some folks in, in Georgia who we may not anticipate will vote for John and Raphael. They may be your coworkers. They may be your fellow congregants. They may be uh, 
somebody you know that you're a, a, a fellow parent at a school who who if you have that conversation with them i think you, you may be able to persuade them so so i want everybody i'm i'm assuming everybody who's listening to this is going to vote and i sure hope everybody who's listening is going to get everybody else that they know to vote in their circle but i also want you to to understand your power and conviction in uh, reaching out, finding common ground, and communicating not just the importance of this election, but the, the real possibilities of, of what America can do on health, jobs, and justice when citizens are active, when we understand that we don't leave this to the high and mighty, but all of us from the ground up uh, decide we're going to make a change. When that happens, nothing can stop it. Uh, so Georgia, get to work. Like Reverend Warnock said, put on put on some shoes, put on some marching shoes. You know, throw off those bedroom slippers. Get out of, from under the covers. Let's do some work, and I'll I'll, I'll do anything I can to be helpful uh, in this process. But ultimately, this is up to Georgia, uh, and 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 you know the people like John and and Raphael representing Georgia that's going to make it happen. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you deeply from all of us here in Georgia. You keep coming back and we keep th saying thank you for what you were doing to keep Georgia on everyone's mind. Thank you, John and Raphael. I also wanna take a moment and thank the volunteers who are working tirelessly to keep Georgia blue. You're knocking on doors safely. You are making phone calls, you're sending text messages and you're doing what these incredible leaders have asked you to do. You are making a plan to vote. You are reaching out to others to ensure they've got a plan and you're believing in your power. And if you will go to IWillVote.com, you can get more information about how you can keep doing that work because this election matters. But more importantly, you matter. The people that showed up in November can show up again. We can vote by mail. Please go ahead and request your absentee ballot. We can vote in person early starting December 14th, and we can vote on Election Day, January 5th. But it's incredibly important that we get to work now. As the president told us, we have the power to change things. And if we will use that power, we will secure a future where we have access to health care, access to jobs, and access to justice. These are the things that we are fighting for. And more importantly, these are the things we deserve. And so I look to all of you to keep the work up, keep the energy up, keep your hope up, and let's get it done. Thank you so much.